The Eve of St. Agnes by John Keats St. Agnes's Eve, ah, bitter chill it was. The owl for all his feathers was a cold. The hare limped trembling through the frozen grass, and silent was the flock in woolly fold. Numb were the beadsman's fingers while he told his rosary, and while his frosted breath, like pious incense from a censer old, seemed taking flight for heaven without a death. Past the sweet virgin's picture, while his prayer he saith, his prayer he saith this patient holy man, then takes his lamp and riseth from his knees, and back returneth meager, barefoot wan, along the chapel aisle by slow degrees. The sculptured dead on each side seem to freeze, imprisoned in black purgatorial rails, knights, ladies praying in dumb oratories. He passeth by, and his weak spirit fails, to think how they may ache in icy hoods and mails. Northward he turneth through a little door, and scarce three steps ere music's golden tongue, flattered to tears this aged man and poor, but no, already had his death bell rung. The joys of all his life were said and sung. His was harsh penance on St. Agnes's Eve. Another way he went, and soon among, rough ashes sat he for his soul's reprieve, and all night kept awake for sinner's sake to grieve. That ancient beadsman heard the prelude soft, and so it chanced for many a door was wide. From hurry to and fro, soon up aloft, the silver snarling trumpets gan to chide, the level chambers ready with their pride. Were glowing to receive a thousand guests, the carved angels ever eager-eyed, starred where upon their heads the cornice rests, with hair blown back and wings put crosswise on their breasts. At length burst in the argent revelry, with plume, tiara, and all rich array, numerous as shadows haunting fairily, the brain new stuffed in youth with triumphs gay of old romance. These let us wish away and turn soul thoughted to one lady there, whose heart had brooded all that wintry day, on love and winged St. Agnes's saintly care, as she had heard old dames full many times declare. They told her how upon St. Agnes's Eve young virgins might have visions of delight and soft adorings from their loves receive upon the honeyed middle of the night. If ceremonies do, they did all right, as supperless to bed they must retire and couch supine their beauties lily white, nor look behind nor sideways but require of heaven with upward eyes for all that they desire. Full of this whim th was thoughtful Madeline, the music yearning like a god in pain. She scarcely heard her maiden eyes divine, fixed on the floor saw many a sweeping train. Passed by she heeded not at all in vain. Came many a tiptoe amorous cavalier, and back retired not cooled by high disdain. But she saw not her heart was otherwhere. She sighed for Agnes's dreams, the sweetest of the year. She danced along with vague, regardless eyes, anxious her lips, her breathing quick and short. The hallowed hour was near at hand, she sighs, amid the timbrels and the thronged resort, of whisperers in anger or in sport. Mid looks of love, defiance, hate, and scorn, hoodwinked with fairy fancy all amort, Save to St. Agnes's and her lambs unshorn, and all the bliss to be before tomorrow morn. So purposing each moment to retire, she lingered still. Meantime across the moors had come young Porpyro, with heart on fire for Madeline. Beside the portal doors, buttressed from the moonlight, stands he and implores all saints to give him sight of Madeline but for one moment in the tedious hours, that he might gaze and worship all unseen, perchance speak, kneel, touch, kiss, in sooth such things have been. He ventures in, let no buzzed whisper tell, all eyes be muffled or a hundred swords will storm his heart. Love's feverous citadel, for him, those chambers held barbarian hordes, 
hyena foemen and hot-blooded lords, whose very dogs would execrations howl. Against his lineage not one breast affords him any mercy in that mansion foul, save one old beldame weak in body and in soul. Ah, happy chance, the aged creature came, shuffling along with ivory-headed wand, to where he stood, hid from the torch's flame, behind a broad hall pillar far beyond. The sound of merriment and chorus bland, he startled her, but soon she knew his face, and grasped his fingers in her palsied hand, saying, Mercy, Papyro, hide thee from this place. They are all here tonight, the whole bloody thirsty race. Get hence, get hence, there's dwarfish Hildebrand. He had a fever late and in the fit. He cursed thee and thine, both house and land. Then there's that old Lord Maurice, not a whit, more tame for his gray hairs, alas me, flit. Flit like a ghost away, ah, gossip dear, we're safe enough here in this armchair sit. And tell me how, good saints, not here, not here. Follow me, child, or else these stones will be thy bear. He followed her through a lowly arched way, brushing the cobwebs with his lofty plume, and as she muttered, well, a uh, well a day, he found him in a little moonlit room. Pale, lattice, chill, and silent as a tomb. Now tell me where is Madeline, said he. Oh, tell me, Angela, by the holy loom, which none but secret sisterhood may see when thy St. Agnes's wool are weaving piously. St. Agnes's, ah, it is St. Agnes's eve. Yet men will murder upon holy days. Thou must hold water in a witch's sieve and be liege lord of the elves and fays. To venture so, it fills me with amaze, the seedy Pipyro, St. Agnes's Eve. God's help, my fair lady, the conjurers play. This very night good angels her deceive, but let me laugh a while, I mickle time to grieve. Feebly she laugheth in the languid moon, while Pipyro upon her face doth look, like puzzled urchin on an aged croon who keepeth close a wondrous riddle book. As spectacle she sits in chimney nook, but soon his eyes grew brilliant when she told his lady's purpose, and he scarce could brook tears at the thought of those enchantments cold and Madeline asleep in a lap of legends old. Sudden a thought came upon a full-blown rose. Flushing his brow and in his pained heart, made purple riot then doth he propose. A stratagem that makes the beldame start, a cruel man and impious th thou art. Sweet lady, let her pray and sleep and dream, alone with her good angels far apart, from wicked men like thee. Go, go, I deem, thou canst not surely be the same that thou didn't, didn't seem. I will not harm her by all saints, I swear, quoth Papyro. Oh, may I ne'er find grace, when my weak voice shall whisper its last prayer, if one of her soft ringlets I displace, or look with ruffian passion in her face. Good Angela, bleed me by these tears, or I will, even in a moment's space, awake with hard shout my foeman's ears, and beard them, though they may be more fanged than wolves and bears. Ah, why wilt thou affright a feeble soul, a poor, weak, palsy-stricken churchyard thing, whose passing bell may air the midnight toll, whose prayers for thee each morn and evening were never missed, thus planning doth she bring a gentler speech from burning papyro, so woeful and of such deep zarring that Angela gives promise she will do whatever he shall wish betide her weal or woe, which was to lead him in close secrecy, even to Madeline's chamber, and there hide him in a closet, of such privacy that he might see her beauty unspied, and win perhaps that night a peerless bride. While legend fairies packed the coverlet, and place enchantment held her sleepy-eyed, never on such a night have lovers met, 
since Merlin paid his demon all the monstrous debt. It shall be as thou wishest, said the dame. All cates and dainties shall be stored there, quickly on this feast night by the tomber frame. Her own loot thou wilt see, no time to spare, for I am slow and feeble and scarce dare. On such a catering trust my dizzy head. Wait here, my child, with patience. Kneel in prayer. The while, ah, thou must needs a lady wed, or may I never leave my grave among the dead. So saying, she hobbled off with busy fear. The lover's endless minutes slowly passed. The dame returned and whispered in his ear, to follow her with aged eyes aghast. From fright of dim espiel, safe at last, through many a dusky gallery they gain, the maiden's chamber silken hushed and chaste, where Propyro took covert, pleased amain. His poor guide hurried back with agues in her brain, her faltering hand upon the balustrade. Old Angela was feeling for the stair, when Madeline, St. Agnes's charmed maid, rose like a mission spirit unaware. With silver tapered light and pious care, she turned and down the aged gossip led to a safe level matting, now prepare, young Papyro for gazing on that bed. She comes, she comes again, like a dove frayed and fled. Out went the taper as she hurried in. Its little smoke and pallid moonshine died. She closed the door, she panted all akin, to spirits of the air and visions wide. No uttered syllable or woe be tied, but to her heart, her heart was voluble, painting with eloquence her balmy side, as though a tongueless nightingale should swell, her throat in vain and die heart stifled in her dell. A casement high and triple arch there was, all garlanded with caravan imageries, of fruits and flowers and bunches of knot grass, and diamonded with panes of quaint device. Innumerable of stains and splendid dyes, as are the tiger's moth's deep damask wings, and in the midst among thousand heraldries, and twilight saints and dim emblazonings, a shielded scutcheon blushed with blood of queens and kings. Full on this casement shone the wintry moon, and threw warm ghouls on the Madeline's fair breast, as down she knelt for heaven's grace and boon. Rose bloom fell on her hands, together pressed, and on her silver cross soft amethyst, and on her hair a glory like a saint. She seemed a splendid angel, newly dressed. Save wings for heaven, Papyro grew faint. She knelt so pure a thing, so free from mortal taint. Anon his heart revives, her vespers done. Of all its rusted pearls, her hair she frees unclasps her warm jewels one by one, loosens her fragrant bodice by degrees. Her rich attire creeps rustling to her knees, half hidden like a mermaid in seaweed. Pensive a while she dreams awake and sees, in fancy fair Agnes's in her bed. But dare not look behind or all the charm is fled, soon trembling in her soft and chilly nest, in sort of wakeful swoon, Perplexed she lay, until the poppied warmth of sleep oppressed, her soothed limbs and sue and soul fatigued away. Flown like a thought until the morrow day, blissfully half both from joy and pain, clasped like a missile where swart pinums pray, blind alike from sunshine and from rain, as though a rose should shut and be a bud again. Stolen to this paradise and so entranced, Papyra gazed upon her empty dress and listened to her breathing, if chanced, to wake into a slumberous tenderness, which when he heard that minute did he bless, and breath himself then from the closet crept, noiseless as fear in a wide wilderness, and over the hushed carpet, silent stepped, and tween the curtains peeped where low how fast she slept. Then by the bedside where the faded moon made a dim silver twilight soft he set, a table and half anguish drew thereon, a doth of woven crimson gold and jet. Oh, for some drowsy morphian amulet, 
the boisterous midnight festive clarion, the kettle drum and far heard clarinet, affray his ears, though but in dying tone, the hall door shuts again, and all the noise is gone. And still she slept in an azure lidded sleep, in blanched linen smooth and lavendered, while he from forth the closet brought a heap of candied apple quince and plume, and gourd with jelly soober than creamy curd. And lucent shrops tinct with cinnamon, manna and dates in agrosy transferred, from fez and spice dainties every one, from silken samarkand to cedared Lebanon. These delicacies he heaped with glowing hand, on golden dishes and in baskets bright, of wreathed silver sumptuous they stand, in the retired quiet of the night, filling the chilly room with perfume light. And now, my love, my seraph, fair awake, thou art my heaven, I, I thine, Eremite. Open thine eyes for meek St. Agnes's sake, or I shall drowse beside thee, so my soul doth ache. Thus whispering his warm, unnerved arm, sank in her pillow. Shaded was her dream, by the dusk curtains twas a midnight charm. Impossible to melt as ice stream, the lustrous salvers in the moonlight gleam. Broad golden fringe upon the carpet lies, it seemed he never, never could redeem. For such a steadfast spell his lady's eyes, so must a while untold in woof fantasies. Awakening up, he took her hollowed lute. Tumultuous and in chords that tenderest be, he played an ancient ditty, long since mute, in province called La Belle Dem Sans Mercy, close to her ear touching the melody, where with disturbed she uttered a soft moan. He ceased. She panted quick, and suddenly her blue afraid eyes wide upon open shone. Upon his knees he sank, pale as smooth sculptured stone. Her eyes were open, but she still beheld, now wide awake the vision of her sleep. There was a painful change that nigh expelled, the blisses of her dream so pure and deep, at which fair Madeline began to weep, and moaned forth witless words with many a sigh, while still her gaze on Papyra would keep who knelt with joined hands and piteous eye, fearing to move or speak, she looked so dreamingly. Ah, Papyro, she said, but even now thy voice was at sweet tremble in mine ear, made tunable with every sweetest vow, and those sad eyes were spiritual and clear. How changed thou art, how pallid, chill, and drear. Give me that voice again, my Papyro. Those looks immortal, those complainings dear, O oh, leave me not in this eternal woe, For if thou diest, my love, I know not where to go. Beyond a mortal man, impassioned far, At these voluptuous accents he arose, Erythral flushed and like a throbbing star, Seen mid the sapphire's heaven's deep repose. In her dream he melted as the rose, Blendeth its odor with the violet, Solution sweet, meantime the frost wind blows, like love's alarm pattering the sharp sleet, against the window pane Saint Agnes's moon hath set. Tis dark, quick pattereth the flaw blown sheet. Tis is no dream, my bride, my Madeline. Tis dark, the Isis gust still rave and beat. No dream, alas, alas, and woe is mine. Papyra will leave me here to fade and pine. Cruel, what traitor could thee hither bring? I curse not, for my heart is lost in thine. Thou, thou say it, forsakest a deceived thing, a dove forlorn and lost with sick unpruned wing. My Madeline, sweet dreamer, lovely bride, say may I be for I thy vassal, blessed, thy beauty shield heart-shaped and vermeil dyed. Ah, silver shrine, here will I take my rest, after so many hours of toil and quest, a famished pilgrim saved by miracle, though I have found I will not rob thy nest, saving of thy sweet self, if thou thinkest well, 
to trust fair Madeline to no rude infidel. Hark, tis an elfin storm from fairyland, of haggard seeming but a boon indeed. Arise, arise, the morning is at hand, the bloated wassellers will never heed. Let us away, my love, with happy speed. There are no ears to hear or eyes to see, drowned all in Rhenish and the sleepy mead. Awake, arise, my love, and fearless be, for o'er the southern moors I have a home for thee. She hurried at his words, beset with fears, for there were sleeping dragons all around, at glaring watch perhaps with ready spears. Down the wide stairs a darkling way they found. In all the house was heard no human sound. A chain-drooped lamp was flickering by each door. The arras, rich with horsemen, hawk and hound, fluttered in the besieging winds uproar, and the long carpets rose along the gusty floor. They glide like phantoms into the wide hall, like phantoms to the iron porch they glide, where lay the porter in uneasy sprawl, with a huge empty flagon by his side. The wakeful bloodhound rose and shook his hide, but his sagus eye and innate owns, by one and one the bolts fill easy slide. Thus chains lie flat silent on the foot-worn stones, the key turns and the door upon its hinges groans. And they are gone, a eh, ages long ago. Those lovers fled away into the storm. That night the baron dreamt of many a woe, and all his warrior guests with shade and form, of witch and demon and large coffin warm. Long be nightmared, Angela the old, died palsy twitched with meager face deform. The beadsman after thousand abs told, for I unsought for slept among his ashes cold.